Welcome to Chapter 12, Information on Food Safety. In this section, our first section, we'll be covering microorganisms. About 48 million cases of foodborne illness occur each year, and 300 deaths annually. This is information according to the Center for Disease Control. Take a look at is how microbes cause infection. Um, and I should say cause illness because they can do so by infection, intoxication, or enterotoxins, or being enterotoxins. An infection is when you ingest the bacteria, the bacteria then multiplies, it grows, and then takes over our natural, um, our natural immune system or our host response. It then disrupts normal bodily functions. This can, um, not result in illness, or if there are many bacteria, will result in illness. Intoxication is um, common with a lot of foodborne illnesses, and it's a little bit different because once the bacteria is ingested, it then produces a toxin, which then triggers an illness. Um, and this is, can generally be there, a few days after ingestion, generally not right immediately after. Enterotoxins are bacteria that grow in the gastrointestinal tract, they'll also release uh, toxins. Uh, their incubation period is a little bit longer, so this uh, might be more of a delayed effect. When we think about the microbes, we can think about the good, the bad, and the ugly, because not all microbes are bad. In fact, we have uh, a whole colony of microorganisms in our gastrointestinal tract, particularly our colon, and this is good, this is healthy. Um, we want these bacteria there. In addition, there are bacteria we want to consume. When we think about these from fermented foods, think about it from yogurt. So these are going to add to our bacterial colony. This is going to be healthy. So good. Now, what about the bad? Well, have you ever taken out a piece of meat and it's got that little hue to it? Maybe it's a little off green, a little bit slimy. Um, you can also get a little sliminess even to your the vegetables if they sit in that your refrigerator container too long. Well, this is more food spoilage. And the more common, most common cause is from Pseudomonas, but this is generally not a pathogen, meaning it's generally not gonna to lead to a foodborne illness, or at least the severe ones, which we're gonna talk about. If you eat food that's spoiled, you may not feel good, and there's a potential of getting some sort of illness from it, but generally the bacteria that cause food spoilage do not cause foodborne illness. When we talk about the illness, we're talking about the ugly. And these are pathogens, meaning they're pathogenic. They cause an illness. And these generally don't cause food spoilage. Now, the number of illnesses by category, this is divided down um, to each category. We have uh, poultry and beef. They make up uh, 17 and 12 percent. Our leafy green vegetables, about 13 percent. Vine stock vegetables, 10 percent. Fruits and nuts, uh, 11 percent. Uh, in other, we see that we have we actually have pork and dairy and beans. There are actually some other produce that's in there. Seafood as well. If we take a look and lump some of these together, like our produce, we find out that this information from the CDC, and this is from 98 to 2008. Uh, Produce produce 46% of the illnesses and 23 deaths, 23% of all deaths that occurred during those years. Beef and poultry, um, actually meat and poultry, so do have pork in here too, 22% of illnesses, but look at this, a greater cause of death. So the illnesses, half the illnesses that were produced from produce, so that's, that's a little bit concerning, but uh, they're more... Uh, basically greater risk of death from these type of bacteria. So the bacteria in meat and poultry tend to be more deadly. Dairy and eggs, you almost you rarely hear about dairy and eggs causing um, any sort of foodborne illness in the media, but uh, look, they're almost as uh, great of a chance as meat and poultry products. And then fish and shellfish. I want to talk a little bit about bacterial growth because you'll see how it pertains to manufacturers, distributors, uh, consumers like ourselves. When you, when you look at this graph, the number of bacteria are shown 
here on the left, and then the amount of time is shown down here on the x-axis. And initially, when you have bacteria, let's just say you have, I'm just going to take an example. You have a few bacteria that are on a piece of meat, and it's in a packaging. It was just packaged. It's sent out. It's going to be at the grocery store, and then you'll pick it up. Well, there's a lag phase. When that bacteria get into the meat, they first have to adjust to their environment, and that's called their lag phase. They don't really do anything. They don't, um, they don't die off. They don't grow. They just they remain stable right through here. But then they'll hit a point of exponential growth. And what I mean by that is they double. They just they keep growing exponentially. It's not this slow process that gradually goes up. It's a, an exponential growth phase. Um, and this is in the right environment. We're going to talk about that next. Then there's a stationary phase where they're neither dying off or uh, doubling, growing in size. The colony isn't growing. Um, and then they'll die off. So this is just kind of the, the natural phase of bacteria, whether they're bacteria that cause foliage or foodborne illness. Now, what we want to think about is how to decrease this, you know, the amount of doubling of this bacteria. And we can decrease it one way is really produce a longer lag time. So how do we keep bacteria in their lag time where they're really not doing anything, they're not growing? Because if we only have a few bacteria, even if we ingested them, they're probably not going to cause any harm. So ways to do that, and this is everyone from the, the processors to the packagers, distributors, the, the sales, um, retail, and then the consumer, as we think about um, one, the pH, so lower pH, more acidity, will decrease, um, will extend the lag phase, it'll decrease that growth phase. Refrigeration and freezing, so keeping it below 40 degrees, that's going to decrease the lag phase, or it's really going to slow that exponential growth phase. Taking out water, that's why a lot of your products don't have water in them, because bacteria need water, they need nutrients. So if you limit those items, then you are going to prevent both the spoilage as well as the chances of those bacteria um, replicating to produce foodborne illness. Now let's look specifically at temperature. What if we don't keep the food cold or we don't heat it up to a high enough temperature to cook it? And that's our 40 to 140 range. Your refrigerator is 40 degrees. And in that phase, the bacteria will multiply, but not at the exponential rate. It's really slowed. In the freezer, they don't die in the freezer, but they don't um, replicate. So they're not going to grow in the freezer. They grow at a very slow rate in the refrigerator. That's how we really keep this, um, this growth phase down. What about the 40 to 140 range? Now, over 140, that's when you're cooking at high temperatures. And I mean scalding hot, not anything you can put your hand in that you could tolerate. That will kill the bacteria. But in between this rage, that's where, in between this rage, that's where we see the exponential growth. And you can see here, I'm going to go back two slides. So if this is the number of bacteria, we get up to here. This is a certain number of bacteria, and this is the time it takes if we keep foods in this area. We, it takes a lot less time to have the same amount of bacteria. The more bacteria, the greater chance for spoilage and the greater chance for foodborne illness. So for every 10 degree of increase in this range, you can think about it as doubling the growth rate. For every 10 degree decrease, you cut that rate in half. I'm going to give you an example of E. coli, which we'll talk about uh, next. E. coli doubles about every 15 to 20 minutes. This is called as generation time, meaning the colony doubles. It'll go from, if there were 16 bacteria, it'll double to 32 and then 64. So it doubles. And that's that exponential growth phase I was talking about. Salmonella is about in that same range. Now, if we look at what would happen in a six-hour period, if it was at, in between that, you know, 40 to 140 range, it would basically go from one bacteria to a million. So look at this. And this just shows you how that exponential growth rate, when you're doubling, how fast it can get to a million. So these are just 20-minute increments. Um, and generally, over six hours, you go from one bacteria to a million. So where, where do I think that this might pertain to me? I'm never going to leave meat sitting out on the counter for six hours. But you know, what, about if, what about the that barbecue or the potluck or maybe that buffet? Maybe they're not keeping it 
food as hot as it should be. Uh, maybe they're not changing it out. Maybe it's not as cold as it should be. But these are things that you want to start thinking about. Now this is the end of our section on microorganisms. And next we'll be talking about E. coli, salmonella, and listeria.